Good afternoon. This is Rob Carter with the Division of Agriculture here uh, in Palmer. I'm, I'm sitting in for Director Dave Shady to, um, I will say, monitor, mediate, whatever you want to call it. Um, one of our Facebook Live events today uh, with our special guest from Kodiak, uh, Marion, is going to give us a, a, a talk and a teaching and a presentation on seed starting, um, which is just about uh, applicable this time of the year. So um, please, I'll be watching comments and, uh, and questions, post them in the chat. Uh, we'll keep an eye on it and take a look and try to answer those as we move along. If we run out of time, um, we'll follow up with them in the end or, or maybe another Q&A session another time. So um, I'll let you take it over, Miriam. Thank you for joining us and thank you for uh, presenting to everyone here that's going to watch today. Oh, thank you for having me on this uh, blessed three day, even in Kodiak. Um, I'm Marian Owen and welcome to this workshop, Seed Starting Made Easy, how to grow vigorous transplants from seeds to seedlings, even if you are a newbie. I'm gonna go ahead and dig in and start by sharing my screen with you. And then everybody else is in charge of Q and A's. <laughs> All righty, here we go. So what I like to do at the beginning of my workshops is um, share a little bit about what's happening in our neighborhood here in Kodiak. And this is the view from our second story window. And so a lot of you can relate to this. It's still winter, but a great time to start seedlings. When it comes to starting your own seedlings, though, if you're like most gardeners, you might have run into some challenges, you know, like these. Like when to start your seeds? When do you transplant them? How to safely grow seedlings on the windowsill. This is very popular. How to transplant seedlings into larger pots. We call it potting up. How to grow seedlings that don't get spindly and fall over. Watering, too much, too little. You know, it's kind of like, you know, Goldilocks. How much light and what kind of light? And where do you begin if you've never grown seeds into a seedling before? So if any of these challenges ring true for you, trust me, you are in the right place. Besides, you don't have to get it perfect. You just have to get it growing. I wanna share a little of my experience here in Kodiak. Um, in 1984, 85, I stopped going to sea as a living, working on research ships and tugboats. But when I got on land, one of the first things I wanted to do was have my own garden. I knew nothing about it. So I did a little research and uh, started my own compost pile in the middle of the winter in Kodiak. And then within a short time, this is my first garden. I was so excited that I wanted to share what I had learned and my successes. So now after 25 years, I am still writing weekly gardening columns. And you'll notice, let's see down there, it says one, two, eight, five. That's how many columns I've done. I love teaching about gardening. This is a shot in our yard um, with some grade school kids and different workshops, but let's dig in. And let's start with why start your own seedlings? A lot of people or animals ask this same question. And by the way, as a little housekeeping here, if at any time, I know this is being recorded, if at any time you wanna take a screenshot of some of these slides that I'm gonna show you, feel free. So why start your own seedlings? Well, first of all, it's on your time schedule. You don't have to wait for uh, Lowe's or your, or your local um, nurseries to come out with their plant stock. You get a jump on the growing season, which is why I've heard that some people have a garage full of seedlings and I have seedlings in my kitchen, in my living room and in my garage and out in my hoop house. You do save money, generally speaking. You have a greater selection of choices, which is really fun. You learn something new and besides, seedlings don't care if you're having a bad hair day. That said, uh, there's an inside look at our spring uh, greenhouse or hoop house. And on the left, as we'll talk about, those are transplants. And on the right, they're actually grown directly sown. So we're gonna talk about the difference there. And also um, getting a jump on the growing season means you get to eat tomatoes and cucumbers and so on 
earlier than everybody else. And then of course, why grow your own food, which is near and dear to my heart and many people's hearts these days. Um, thanks to COVID, a lot of the attention to our, our homes and, and being closer to home has really brought focus to growing some of our own food. And one of the reasons is because the rising cost of food. Now, this is not a real happy statistic because since 2000, food prices have gone up an average of two and a half percent every year. And then you've got food security concerns that the Department of Ag has said that nearly 70% of the fresh produce that's sold in the US contains some sort of residue of some sort of chemical, pesticides, herbicides, and so on. So here's a little tip for you. This is a wonderful guide. It's the Shopper's Guide to Pesticides and Produce. And the Environmental Working Group produces this every year. It's a little pocket-sized, um, yeah, like in your wallet guide, and they present their Dirty 12, like the, the worst produce that would have any kind of residue on them. Top on the list is strawberries, and then there's celery and potatoes, and the Clean 15, which are the cleanest kind. Excuse me. Um, and then you've got what we came up against here in Kodiak is in January, um, it was really brought home how delicate our transportation system is for delivering food actually throughout Alaska. And we uh, had the experience of a couple of container ships that skipped Kodiak because of weather. So it was not unusual for a certain amount of time to go to the grocery store and you didn't find a whole lot of produce on the shelves. So then we have nutrition and taste. There's nothing like homegrown tomatoes. Besides kids learn where real food comes from. We also have health assurance, we call it. So the CDC says a growing body of research shows that fresh fruits and veggies, like your mom said, are crucial to promoting good health. And it stretches your food budget. I mean, when you look at a packet of say 100 seeds, like lettuce seeds, uh, three bucks. 100 heads of lettuce, woo, now we're talking 300 to $500. So that said, it's important to know that seeds are alive which means you might be wondering if you've had packets of seeds hanging around in your garage or whatever, how long are these viable? If you're not sure, of course, then conduct a germination test. You know, you take um, paper towels that are soaked in water and you put say 10 seeds in between those paper towels, put them in a Ziploc bag and see which ones sprout. And that'll give you a percentage. This is a great chart you might want to take a screenshot of, or you can refer back when the uh, recording is available. And it, it talks about how certain seeds will last a long time, say um, turnip seeds, five years, but onion seeds, on the other hand, it says only one to two years. That's why I buy fresh onion seeds every year. So you might wonder what to grow. You have seedlings you can start, or you can direct sow seeds. Some plants, especially root crops, carrots and parsnips and so on, they don't transplant well and should be started direct from seed. So let's take a look. Like I said, on the left, we've got transplants. And on the right, these are all directly sown. So I do this pretty early on. As a matter of fact, I have sown seeds in my um, hoop house on my birthday, on March 4th. These are very hardy. These are some of your salad greens, um, uh, hockeray turnips and cress. And hey, I just start them because I'm just so excited, but I know um, depending on the weather, they'll just germinate away for me. So here's a list of direct sow as in directly in the soil from seed your beans, your peas, 
um, beets, carrots, spinach, and so on. Sow direct or grow with seedlings. You kind of have a choice here. This includes Swiss chard and lettuce, mustard greens, like a mix for um, salads, nasturtiums, and cress. Now, when I say either or, it's because as the summer progresses, it's a lot easier to just sprinkle out some lettuce seeds and they'll germinate right away. You don't have to start them early. And then you grow seedlings for transplanting. This is a big list. Uh, kale and basil, tomatoes, peppers, cauliflower, thyme, squash, and so on. Now here's a little chart that I developed just a little graph I developed when I was learning how to grow seedlings and I had no idea where to start. It was just like so confusing to look at a seed catalog and go, well, when do I start them and who and what do they need? And so basically I would list a plant or variety here and then I'd check off. Is it an annual? Does it, does it need to be trans uh, planted every year or perennial? How many days until it actually germinates, the seed germinate? Do I sow it directly in the soil or grow it as a transplant? And should I start the transplants um, four weeks or six weeks before transplanting outside? That really helped me, we'll talk about that. And what about the spacing between plants? So how much are you gonna grow? So what are you gonna grow? Here's a variety pack. You've got cute cabbage, of course. Uh, there is yours truly getting ready to make tons of sauerkraut. And lettuce, just a little tip here, the darker it is, the hardier and healthier. And kohlrabi, this is a fun veg. You can eat fresh or cooked. And Brussels sprouts, how do you like those trees? Swiss chard, which I think is one of the most beautiful vegetables. So I usually plant them where I can photograph them easily. And then we have onions, both your bunching onions and your bulbing onions. And uh, it's important when thinking about growing onions, you have long day, short day and neutral day. Because in Alaska, we've got long days, then you wanna select onions, be it sets or seeds, that are a long day onion. Uh, day neutral onions often work here, but not necessarily your Walla Walla sweets. But my rule of thumb is, if you don't know, go ahead and try. There's no hurt in trying. Cress, this is kind of fun. Cress is the new top dog vegetable. It's bumped kale off the top as being the healthiest green vegetable you can eat. Dill, of course, is wonderful to start from seed, both for the feathery herb content to just the seeds themselves. Um, zucchini, poppies, nasturtiums, cucumbers, tomatoes. All right, so let's get to it. Sowing seeds early indoors. Ladies and gentlemen, start your seeds, Ugh. but when? Here's a very, very handy chart. Thanks to Deb Blaylock. Um, she monitors or is the admin for the Alaska Home Growers Facebook group. And she put this together. This is something you might wanna take a little screenshot of. And you can see already in March, there's quite a list of seeds to go ahead and start. Okay, I'll just hang out here for a little bit. Looks like we have so, one one comment in there, Marion, that says that uh -huh. the charts were a little fuzzy. And I think that we can, once this is recorded, we'll probably can get links to these and be able to put them and post them here um, through our Facebook page so people can take a look and see them a little clearer and a little slower, so. Oh, sure. And what else I can do is uh, you can send me a list of what you want me to send and I can send you some um, some JPEGs and you can share them with people too. Wonderful. There yeah. we go, Diana. We'll get it taken care of and we'll get it posted Happy to so do you that. have access. Thank you, Marion. So when you're growing seedlings to a transplantable size, here's a list of vegetables. And looking at this 10 to 12 weeks from your transplant date, we'll talk about this, 
10 to 12 weeks, that includes celery, leeks, and globe artichokes. So that's a good three months before you, you plan on transplanting outside. Eight to 12 weeks, as in uh, two to three months, you got your onions and green onions, uh, six to eight weeks, tomatoes. This is you know all variable, but it's a guideline. And four to six weeks, as in a month to a month and a half, Swiss chard, broccoli, a big bulk of what you're gonna grow as far as vegetables go. How about herbs? 12 to 14 weeks, chives, oregano, mint, parsley, eight to 12 weeks, like um, two months to three months, thyme, uh, feverfew, catnip for those of you that have um, addicted cats, six to eight weeks, and that's the bulk here, dill, chervil, and um, sage, and so on. So flowers, 20 weeks. If you plan on growing uh, sweet peas, better get started on those guys. 12 to 14 weeks is when you've got pansies and coleus. Eight to 12 weeks, your snaps, alyssum, that wonderful scented white, um, generally white uh, ground cover flower. Six to eight weeks, you've got your calendula and daisies and four to six weeks, marigolds and so on. Now, when to sow these seeds indoors for transplanting outdoors? So this is where you would look at your calendar and your growing conditions and take into account maybe your microclimate where you live, where you have your garden. So let's take an example of broccoli. Let's say that you wanna transplant your broccoli seedlings outside on May 15th. So we learned from the chart I showed you here, uh, back here, that broccoli takes four to six weeks to start them four to six weeks before you transplant outside. So that means counting backwards, you need to start sowing broccoli, cabbage, kale, and so on on April 1st. Um, April Fool's Day, I can't think of anything better to do, right? So what about frost-free dates? I used to fret about this too when um, I was starting out, but, and then I would, and then I would do talks at the Seattle Flower and Garden Show and they say, well, what zone are you guys in? And I just started saying, well, you know, I'm in the ozone. <laughs> because um, if you protect your plants, as in uh, with mini hoops or a large high tunnel or frost covers, then it's not that big of a deal. And also if you are transplanting outside in, in, a, in a sunnier area, out of the wind, et cetera, again, you can push the envelope. So something to think about, as in here's inside of our hoop house, early, early, early spring. I'm not worried about frost. Outside though, now you'll see here, I have uh, spinach seedlings growing. And spinach is our favorite winter green because we actually sow spinach seeds in early September. They get about three inches high. Winter hits, daylight dwindles, and then they kind of die back a little bit. However, the roots are established well enough. So when the day length pops above say 10 hours and growth resumes generally for plants, then they start growing again. So we can eat, we're already eating fresh spinach today. Okay, let's talk about containers. You can go low tech, like yogurt cups and cottage cheese containers with holes punched in the bottom, or you can go really high tech where it's watering on the bottom and it soaks up through the top. It's a very fancy way to grow seedlings, a little more expensive. So here's some options for you, do-it-yourselfers, salad bar pots or containers, jiffy pots. You've got your six packs on the right, like your plastic pots. Um, bottom left, you've got your plastic cups that you might have a profusion of, uh, tofu, yogurt containers, egg cartons. And I'm gonna talk about pros and cons, as in I really am not fond of jiffy pots. And the reason being is they're a little more expensive 
And uh, jiffy pots, particularly the ones that have the mesh on the outside when you water them and they, you know, they, they open up. Um, sometimes in cool soils, the jiffy pot and those discs, they don't break down fast enough and the roots get pretty cramped. So if you have to say, use up a batch of those, I forget what you call them, little discs that you add water and they expand, um, cut through that mesh and allow the roots to pop open through them. The plastic cups on the bottom left, um, they're okay to use, but there's one little thing that's not so great about these plastic cups that I'll share in a little bit. Tofu and yogurt containers are fine, like I said. Egg cartons, I know egg cartons are pretty popular, but the um, two things is the root area isn't big enough. It doesn't, um, it dries out too quickly, the water. And sometimes, particularly the fiber egg cartons, the roots will actually get into the fiber of the, of the container, the, the cardboard, and it's a little damaging to the root system. One of my favorite ways to start seeds, particularly small ones, is to use this um, mini soil cuber. Um, you punch out 20 blocks at a time, four by five there, of three quarter inch cubes. And after you fill it up like this, you press it in, kind of the consistency of um, oatmeal. And then you punch them out into, you know, this is a top to a um, aluminum cake pan that I'm using here. And um, sow the seeds. But the beautiful thing is that when you transplant these little cubes of seeds, uh, seedlings, it's less a problem with transplant shock. I've been using mine for 30 years, and I, I think they're made in the UK, but they're very available right now through um, a variety of catalogs and sources. So one of my favorite, favorite tools is a pencil. Because when you roll the tip of the pencil on the damp soil, you can then go over to your, like a handful of broccoli seeds, and you can pick up, or tomato seeds, and you pick up just one, then you roll it onto the soil and it's planted. So this is what it looks like after um, a week or two. And then you transplant them up to the next size container. So let's talk about that um, transplanting up and the care and feeding of seedlings. Oh, well, Marion, if you have time, we have one, one question here. And what are your thoughts sure. about using eggshells for seed starting? Um, Eggshells are okay. Just be be sure you've got the hole in the bottom, and uh, and it's a little more difficult to um, maintain the water that much water, especially when it gets bigger. So just just maintain or or keep in track of the the water and um, how big the plant is getting. So um, that would be my first thought. And it's not your final container, and I'll talk about why in just a second. That's it's a very good question. So hold on to that thought. Do you have another question? Anybody else? Oh, that's it for now, thanks. Okay. So care and feeding of seedlings. Um, remember this, my flats. We'll talk about M for moisture, F feeding, L light, air, A, temperature is T, soil is S, my flats. So moisture, thou shalt keep seedling damp never too wet, not too dry, never let them dry out. And this is a little tip. If you are buying seedlings at the, at the uh, nursery or a big box store, it's okay to gently slip out, gently slip out that root ball and see if it's really crowded and if it's damp all the way through or not, because sometimes what happens is staff gets busy and they run around and water them and you don't know if they're stressed out or not. It's very important. Um, watering tips is you want to use a sprayer in the beginning, but later on you want to water seedlings from below so that they encourage that root um, system to soak up the water from below. So start with spraying your seedlings and then uh, water from below. Now, one thing I wanna talk about is if you look over here, these are calendula 
And then these are tomatoes. And this is also true for broccoli and cabbage and kale. When you transplant or pot up to the next size container, you want to transplant like your broccoli all the way up, cover that stem all the way up to that first set of seedling leaves. So I'll talk, I'll show you here when we get to feeding. You can see these are your, your seed leaves per se, and these are your true leaves. You want to transplant up to this point. Otherwise you have long stem leaves and it's, it's difficult for the plant to survive and not flop over in the wind. So for feeding, you wanna begin feeding seedlings, preferably with a diluted organic fertilizer when they develop, like I said, that second set of leaves, that's your cue. This is also time to pot them up at this point. Now you might wonder, uh, so how do I know what's what? Well, when they do get their true leaves, as in true leaves all around here, these are the same family. But if you look carefully at those first set of leaves, they're all heart-shaped. So it's hard to tell who's what until they get their true set of leaves. Well, we've got L another question for, here, Mary, uh -huh. for you. I think yep. it's a good segue here. Um, how about uh, if you're only starting a few to just start them in their large pots to begin with? No, because when you, I, I tried that too. So if you do start in the large pot, uh, some seeds might not germinate. So you kind of wasted your time a little bit, but also you do need to bury when you go from, um, when you go from these guys, and they're big enough to transplant to the larger size pot, you do want to bring them down in the soil, your broccoli, your cabbage, your kale, your tomatoes. Now, that said, for your lettuce seedlings, you don't do that. Lettuce needs to be not buried, otherwise it tends to get crown rot. So keep the lettuce and so on up above a little bit. So, um, for me, about the only time that I will actually plant seeds directly into those six packs, the larger pots, that would be for uh, sweet peas, nasturtiums, um, beans, like the runner beans that I'll grow in my hoop house and so on. So um, after a while, you just kind of get to know what's more efficient for what you're doing. Okay, um, light, L for light. I'd say in the 30 plus years I've been growing seeds and teaching this, light or the lack of it is one of the most frustrating things for uh, seed starting people to deal with because without enough light, the seedlings become uh, weak and uh, I call them couch potato seedlings. It's too warm and it's not enough light they're reaching for the light, they're struggling, they need that energy. So it's important to keep the light source, uh, be it fluorescent or LED. Um, for you horse lovers, a hand width above the tops of your seedlings, which means you'll have to either raise your lights or lower your floor or raise your plants up and down. So two to four inches is optimum. Now, um, even if you're using LED lights, uh, two inches, three inches is, is optimum because it's not creating that heat. And um, again, you have to either move the lights up and down or your plants. And generally speaking, um, starting out plants, people will turn on the timer for 14 to 16 hours. And uh, for mature seedlings, I tend to go with 12 to 14, but I usually go 14 hours. So um, remember, it's tempting to just leave the, the lights on 24 hours, but a, a plant cycle, as far as uh, making food for itself, um, it, it needs that, that dark period. So without getting into too much science here. And you can set up seedlings, you know, anywhere that's convenient. If you find racks like this, uh, my hat's off to you. It's really handy hanging uh, lights from a chain. Um, and uh, another thing is don't keep things too warm for plants. And I'll talk about that in a second. 
A for air circulation. You remember when I was talking about these cups? Well, I learned a long time ago from Ed Hume, um, who his company is down in the Pacific Northwest, a seed company. He told me that um, air circulation or lack of it is the other um, factor that people tend to forget. So if you have soil, be it in a cup or a six pack or an eggshell, it's important to keep the soil as close to the top as possible. If you don't, what happens is a dead zone of air collects at the soil level and then you invite damping off disease where one day your plant's looking vibrant and healthy and just great and the next day it's face planted, pardon the pun, on the soil, right pinched at right at the soil line and it's toast. So if you're gonna use things like this, your cups, your yogurt containers and so on, uh, make sure that it's topped off as much as possible. Temperature, uh, some plants like a little head start, uh, the root zone, or maybe your garage is a little cool. And you'll notice that I have carved into this insulation, this blue foam, I've got Christmas tree lights. Now these are non-LED uh, Christmas tree lights, the incandescent type. So they do generate a little bit of heat. It's just perfect for starting seeds. In fact, um, I have these Christmas lights uh, strung about four inches below the soil line in my hoop house so I can put them around the roots of my tomatoes and my cucumbers that cucumbers in particular don't like cool soil. So they're very handy. All right, so soil, S for soil. This is something that I used to teach that we all need to use fertile soil for starting seeds. It's, I mean, that kind of soil needs to hold moisture yet drain well, you can purchase or make your own, should be sterile. And then I would say, it's really important to use sterile soil, may cause damping off disease. Well, there's really no such thing as sterile soil. I mean, we live in a world um, in bacteria, right? So now this is what I do. I don't worry about the sterile soil and I changed my way because recently I read an article by Jeff Lowenfels, and um, it highlights what Rutgers University is now doing a lot of research on, and that's more of what actually takes place in that soil, that root zone. And they're learning that there is a special cycle called the rhizophagy cycle, where plants will actually allow bacteria into their root system, and then they mine those for what they need in the way of nutrients. In fact, one study is showing that for 30% of plants, nitrogen is, is obtained in this way. So if you use sterile soil, this doesn't happen until that microbial herd is established. And you know what? This is just like our gut bacteria. The more you have uh, a healthy biome of, of gut bacteria, the better off you are at warding off diseases and well, the list is really long. So then I asked Jeff, I said, what is the best living soil to use for a seed potting mix? And he said, compost. So what I do now is I actually start my seedlings. I mean, cause I have a ton of it, not ton, but in uh, a seed starting mix. But as soon as I'm potting up to the next level up, I put it in compost. And so far, fabulous. Compost, by the way, says Leslie Land, um, the former garden writer for the New York Times. It's the all purpose answer to everything. If you have enough of it, you won't need much of anything else. Can you tell I'm excited about compost? Okay, when you're transplanting into new containers, remember, keep track of what it is you're transplanting. Here we have lettuce. The crown is above the soil level, okay? And, in, and that's important for um, a lot of things. And now when I have nasturtiums like this, when I transplant them, I will transplant them by hooking them down even deeper to this junction point. And then after you transplant, it's very important to mark your seeds. 
Troubleshooting. What do you do about aphids? You cry a big tear for one thing, but when people tell me, oh, Marin, I've got this, uh, I've got this profusion of aphids, they're all over the place. And that tells me that they're not paying attention because you can't raise a puppy by just putting a puppy in the corner and then ignoring the puppy. You have to stay in touch. You've got to talk to your seedlings, check on them, look underneath their leaves. If you do get aphids, then um, there's a number of things you can, um, you can squish them, you can produce um, your own little sprays. And I'm happy to share recipes of sprays if, uh, if you guys want. Um, there's lots of things on the market, but it's also an indicator of using chemical fertilizers like miracle Grow, which is no miracle. Very watery tissues, very susceptible to aphids. And then this is what damping off looks like. Right here at the soil level, um, it's like pinched, turned brown and fallen over just overnight. Like I said, I have a variety of sprays that I use and I'm, I'm happy to share recipes. So moving plants outside, moving day, right? The first few minutes spent transplanting are the most important minutes in the life of the plant. So you wanna transplant on a cloudy day. And when slipping the seedlings out of the container, take plenty of soil with the roots. Ah, but when is planting day? Okay, it's a cloudy day, an overcast day, foggy day is great. However, you can't just take seedlings, the couch potato seedlings from your house outside like that. You need to harden them off. Hardening off means you get them accustomed to the outdoor conditions, the real sun, the real wind, and so on. It's just like, I wouldn't think about going to Arizona in the middle of the winter and not use some sort of protection or prepare myself. So some people will do this hardening off period where they take a plant's trays and all outside and then um, bring them back inside for, um, outside for a few hours and bring them back in. Some people will do it over the course of two weeks, some people one week, but it's really important to do this. And you wouldn't put them out in direct sun right away either, like me going to Arizona, right? So just do it gradually. And think in terms while you're growing your seedlings and while you're hardening them off and so on, that healthy soil is really made up of 50% 50, 50 air and water. These are the highways through which nutrients and so on flow and the roots get access to them. Only 5% is organic matter, but that 5% is very, very important. Compost and mulch, the compost is one of the best ways to add organics to your soil. And this is why when I started growing um, garden here in Kodiak, my pH tests of, of my soil, the pH level was down here. Very, very acidic, very sour, which means it's way below the optimum level area, the region for garden plants. And so um, if you look at this chart, the wider these horizontal bands like nitrogen and P phosphorus uh, uh, and K potassium, the wider the band, the more of that nutrient is available to plants. So if pH of the soil here in Kodiak is down here, then these nutrients might be in the soil, but they are locked up and the plant cannot access them. However, after a few years of adding compost, not lime to sweeten the soil or anything, then I was able to bring it up to this zone, this middle zone. Because <laughs> pH can be a little problematic if it's say too, too, too sour or too acidic. And if you look at this chart, this pH preference of a few plants, you can see why maybe, maybe your carrots or your peas or your onions aren't really growing as well as you had hoped. Well, it could be that the pH of your soil is off. So if you're gonna try and grow blueberries, you wouldn't grow them next to a bed of carrots or in a bed of carrots because blueberries really prefer um, 
a strong to medium acidic soil in order to bloom and produce fruit. So let's go over that hardening off process and planting out. Okay, remember a cloudy day, you wanna water well and protect the seedlings from frost, dogs, cats, magpies, crows, all that, okay? Watch the weather and gently slip them out of the containers. Uh, this is a, a clumps of um, uh, uh, arugula and salad greens. It might be a beautiful day in your neighborhood to do window washing and so on, but it's not great for plants. So you do need to protect them from uh, rain. And I mean, I've used about anything you can think of um, over the years to protect plants, even um, old shower curtains over plants. And this is what I do now. I've got uh, raised beds and I have installed permanently in these raised beds, these PVC pipes, and they're screwed in from the inside into the wood. These are four by sixes. Um, they seem like overkill four by sixes, but uh, we've, we've gone to those and stacked them because I'm not getting any younger. I just turned 65, yay. And I can stand on them, I can put tools on them. And then um, I use this reinforced plastic um, to drape over and pull back if I want to. And then what I've found to be very, very handy are these two inch wide black uh, paper clips. They go perfectly right over three quarter inch PVC. Here's a shot of um, what I use to protect plants and get seedlings and seeds going uh, in the spring is I've got a variety of things going here. I've got a shrimp net or webbing to keep the birds out. I've got these milk cartons to protect some real tender seedlings. And if you look carefully, you'll see right through the handle here, I've got a piece of stiff wire poked through a hole, through the handle and about six or eight inches into the soil. So that anchors it because we have wind that anchors it. And then on a sunny day, I actually lift up that milk carton just a little bit, pivot or rotate on the wire, set it down alongside so that the sun can beat down on that dark uh, compost rich soil and heat up that root zone. And then, um, then if it gets cloudy or rainy, then I just lift it up, rotate it, put it back down. I don't bother with the cap, it's just fine. And the plant needs to breathe, whatever little rain gets in there is just fine. And then here's another secret that you might appreciate is over here, I have sown um, hawkeray turnip seeds. Now, we get the uh, root maggot um, here. And so in order to prevent the root maggots from developing, you have to stop the fly um, laying eggs at the plant base in the first place. So I use the tool fabric, you know, that, that wedding mesh fabric comes in all colors and I stretch it over these hoops and I anchor it down around the edges. Voila, I have no root maggot problems and I don't have holy turnips or radishes anymore. Okay, what's next? Um, if you get ready for some screenshots and I can share these later, um, here's some of my favorite, favorite gardening books and I've got shelves and shelves of them. Um, Lawrence Hills, by the way, is, um, I think he started one of the first and the largest organic gardening groups in the world uh, called Grow Organic. He's from the UK. Um, seaweed, how it's so important and helpful for plants. Uh, how to grow garlic. And if you're trying to grow year round, Elliot Coleman's book, this Bible, the Winter Harvest Handbook, highly recommended. Um, Seeds, this uh, by Peter Lauer, is a fabulous read. And of course, Nancy um, and her new Seed Starters Handbook is another Bible. Uh, edible flowers, um, edible estates, how to turn your lawn into something useful, I think. Um, the bottom left is the afternoon or gardening book, starting um, seeds that you would get from the grocery store. 
um, more beyond avocados. This is a, a funny, funny read, How to Kill Slugs <clears throat> and a fun book, Gardening. Um, herbs um, and Lois Hale's herbs. Now this in particular, I'm, I have a special fondness for because I'm getting ready to build um, or uh, renovate, I should say, our bumblebee houses. We, we build and put houses out for uh, local bumblebees, which that's another passion of mine. And a couple uh, interesting reads here, Secrets of the Soil and Luther Burbank, yes, the Burbank potato, um, his story, which is magnificent. Uh, if you grow in containers, uh, this book, The Bountiful Container, is really helpful. Um, and then I showed you this book, uh, Thousand Gardening Questions and Answers. So that kind of wraps it up. And um, I want to thank gardening angels, uh, John and Rob. You guys are awesome. And you, the gardeners. And uh, just remember, you don't have to get it perfect. You just have to get it growing. And the worst thing that can happen is uh, put it in the compost pile. So I'd like to open this up for questions. If you have any questions that you want to share, or um, and I'll make sure that I get the materials that you want me to put together that you can share for people. Well, Miriam, uh, we greatly appreciate you taking the time to to work with all the folks that have been online and been watching. It looks like there's a, a good group of people out there, and um, I think a lot more of them had a lot more questions than they actually posted in the chat. I think they were more just entertained and enjoying your 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 conversation here. Um, we will go ahead and it looks like we've had some requests for both recipes and some of the documents that you posted. And so um, we'll get uh, one of our angels here, John, to, to get them up and get them collected from you and provide any links that you can get us. Um, and then we'll make sure that we get those posted up for everybody that's in the chat today. Oh, no, see, I made fun of people. And now all of a sudden they start asking, what's the life of PVC for hoops? Oh, I think we've had uh, some hoops for uh, 15 plus years. And they're, they're out there year round. Yep, and I use them to put multiple uh, surfaces on them or materials on them. And, you know, uh, so we just have different materials like light fabric and heavy duty plastic and the mesh and so on available. And we just put it on there and we clamp it down with those two inch wide paper clips. And it's so handy, so handy. There you go, Sarah. We appreciate that. We appreciate all the questions. It's good to communicate with everybody and see them. Um, and uh, it looks like a lot of people are really impressed with your presentation. And again, I wanted to follow up and, and say that we will be reaching out to Miriam and we'll be getting the presentation materials here and getting them posted. Um, I let John do that because he is our expert on the, on the computer and the, and the social media avenues here. Um, looks like we have another question about your hoops. What, how high are they? The ones that are outside, um, they're only about up to my hip. They're only about three feet tall-ish, and that's it. Um, and so here's what I do is, let me go back to um, the very beginning. So if, if you look at these hoops here, they're about three feet tall. And this one uh, contains um, the uh, garlic. And this one has spinach growing in it now. And um, I learned that our strongest wind comes from this direction. It's a nor'easter rain, you know, wind driven rain. So what I do is during the spring when I'm opening these up and closing them, I keep this lath strip. So I forgot to tell you that uh, around these I've got uh, lath strip like narrow strips and I screw them down all around. And when I start getting in and out of these beds is I will undo the leeward side lath strips and keep this one secure to the windward side so it's not as much of a hassle because I will roll these back and then I'll roll them back in there. Now I, you guys look really closely here. See these little bumps? Those little bumps right there in the snow? Those are crocuses. And so I plant crocuses in the lawn and then they'll pop up uh, in the spring and it's just it's really a fun treat. So it sure looks like a really difficult place to garden right there along the water. I mean, I'm just, that looks really, really tough. It is a challenge. It is a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one challenge. more question, I guess here. I think we have a little bit of time for a couple more. Uh -huh. um, what's your go-to compost? Uh, my go-to compost, and I'm happy to send that recipe. And I also have, um, uh, I do webinars every weekend on composting because it's so, it's such a 
Well, if you have enough compost, you don't need oh. much of anything else. <laughs> Mine is 60 degrees right now, by the way. It's 19 in Kodiak. Compost is 60 outside. Um, and it's a good workout. I mean, it's it's it is, It's a great upper body workout. Absolutely. Um, um, let's see. A, a typical one would be um, uh, manure scraps from the farm down the road. So it's a straw and goat manure and rabbit manure, uh, kelp. Uh, leaves that we collected by the bag full, like 20 bags in the fall. Uh, food scraps, food scraps are a big one. And I just go on a treasure hunt. When I made my first compost pile, I didn't have anything. I just basically knocked on doors and I, I cut down dried grass, beach rye, and, and I built my compost pile. So well, here's a good question from Allison, actually, since you're in Kodiak. Do you use old kelp? I do. I use kelp. Um, Pretty much, uh, my preference is the more churned up stuff. You know, mom nature is the best queen and art mama there is. <laughs> so after a few storms, it's all chewed up, and that's what I pick. It's just like the shredded fine stuff, and that's what I use. Mm -hmm. Well, great access to have that there in Kodiak. Yeah, come on down. Let's see if I missed anything. Oh, I think you'll have a lot more people listen to everything you do. I think. Oh, I can't hear you anymore. I can. Can you hear oh, me? No. Yeah, I can hear you now. Perfect. Okay. Well, I think that wraps up. Any more questions? I'll give you one time. I see there's 24 people still live watching this. Oh, what are your thoughts on biochar? That's a long conversation. Um, we have some people here uh, making biochar in Kodiak, and um, I haven't tested it for a long time. And I'll tell you, uh, years ago, a little story is. Uh, my husband and I were invited to meet some friends, some sailing friends down the Caribbean. And in a very remote island, we toured around with some locals and there are plumes of smoke coming up from people's yards and property. And they're all making biochar. They're all making their own, their charcoal, their biochar. So um, I haven't fully uh, experienced it or tested it, but I'd say from what I've heard that it's an excellent addition to your garden, I mean, anything to help. So I'd say, you know, do a test with and without, and then you'll, then you'll get it, your control with and, with and without. And let me know, because I want to know. <laughs> well, looks like we had a bunch of people. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mary, and, and we greatly appreciate it from the division here. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I get to sneak in here for the, it says I'm Dave Shady, but I'm not Dave Shady, but. Um, I, I'm just on his account. So I greatly appreciate listening to your presentation. Um, I, I love plants as much as many, and I always like to learn as much as I can too. So again, we'll put some great reference links in and contacts to stuff that you do, Mary, and, and, and all of the work that you're doing there on Kodiak and get it out statewide that we can do and, and all of your recipes. And we thank everybody for joining us today um, and look forward to another Facebook Live here in the, in the near future. And again, um, we'll be in contact with Mary. Oh, See, look at this. Every time I start talking and threaten to leave, they give me more questions. I'm just going to continue well, I'll, to do that. I'll tell that. you one thing too, though, is um, so, um, I'm, I'm happy to do these. I, I, love, I love helping people um, be successful in their garden. So I have a, I have a list of things and I'll, I'll share with you what I can speak. Well, about. I will tell you from, from this experience for me, it seems like the more that we communicate, the more people ask questions. So maybe that's something for a topic for us here at the division that is to bring you on and just have a Q&A and we won't even totally really have a defined presentation. We can all sit around um, and we can all have a conversation. We can bring pictures of our own plants and uh, all the crazy stuff that we all grow in the wintertime to keep ourselves sane. Um, so I'll finish <laughs> out with this one. Um, one last question, because I think it's very important this time of the year and actually through the growing season. Um, what soil tests do you use, if any? Um, I use uh, Brookside Labs is what I use for testing my soil. And um, after a few years of adding compost and so on, uh, and I had uh, Brookside uh, soil tests come back, um, the, the comment that was, was put on there by a state agent was, um, uh, gardeners would give their eye teeth to have soil test results like this. All I did was add compost. That's all I did. Yeah. But Brookside Labs is probably, my opinion, the best. Yeah. I agree. We use them often. We do a lot of looking at soil samples provided both by home gardeners and commercial folks here at the division. Um, and Brookside has provided great results relatively cheaply and relatively fastly. And um, I right. will say that... Uh, 
yeah, good use of your resource there, Allison. So um, super easy, hop on and do some Google Foo. And I actually, I'm not sure if they call them Brookside Analytical. There's a soils tab and a form you can fill out. You provide an email address. And last time I checked, I think for a, um, a full panel test, it was somewhere just under 20 bucks. So well worth it for your investment for future food and your garden and, and, and enjoyment. So again, I will appreciate everything. We'll go ahead and watch these comments over the next coming days, I'm sure. And um, if there's questions that you have, please post them in the comments and we will um, ourselves or we'll get a hold of Mary and she can chime in um, and look for us in the future. And hopefully, Mary, you'll join us again. I'd greatly appreciate sitting here and having a conversation with you and allow people to chime in um, and have a, have a Q&A. So I appreciate your time today. I appreciate everyone coming on. Um, thanks for joining us here at uh, the Division of Ag and our um, Facebook Live Thursday. So greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Marion.